about animals in the garden, yay or nay. We're going to be a little bit informal today. Um, so what animals are we interested in? Here's a whole list of them. What things, which animals are you thinking about, Doc? Uh, deer, bear, birds, woodchucks, uh, any kind. Let's see. Hummingbird, bees. Yep. Uh, I want the bees for uh, pollination, but I won't have hives. Uh, yeah. As well, any place I could have a hive be far enough back, I can't get there in the winter. Well, there. There we go. Yeah, but I, I feed everybody. I've been feeding everybody since I've been here, not knowing I was going to wind up feeding the, the deer. But I can get now within 15. My deer will come to about 15 yeah. feet from me. My big tom turkey has come to 8 feet from me. Mm -hmm. He's walked to me, and then he'll walk where he's only going to run. My animals know me. Well, they are. Good. So in the question why we want to attract wildlife or animals, you mentioned the bees to pollinate yeah. the flowers, yeah. um, and I, I just like animals. to watch them. I love to watch them. I've learned so many different animals since I've been feeding them here. And I did see a uh, uh, several weeks ago now a oh, what kind of hawk was he? Um, sharp shinned on top of a pigeon. Mm -hmm. You know, only four yeah. feet from me out the bay window. It's like. Well, there. I know that everybody's on the okay. food chain. Yeah. I don't want to see coyotes get wiped out either. Yeah. They're all, you know, we, we need all of because them. Because the population is declining, we want to do things mm -hmm. that aren't going to you, know, you have to keep, to keep, I know, I don't like the way animals hunt. I know it's cruel. Well, um, it's, I'm not sure it's cruel. It's like nature's way. I agree with you. It's nature. But I mean, some of these animals don't die that readily. Yeah. You look at the and that's, uh, look that's at the um, uh, grizzlies going after salmon. They're ripping yeah. the salmon up while the salmon's still. Yeah. And I know it's yes. nature. I mean, I mean, I've rescued mice, wild mice, in the house after when the cats find them. I still can't find my mouse. I know she's around, but the cage is open up on the table. She goes in and out. And when it gets to the point, either I don't see her, or she's so arthritic, then I'll put a pan, a very shallow pan, on the floor with some food and water so that she can eat yeah. until she has it. Well, not everyone likes to attract all animals. Yep. There are some reasons that we, we might want to deter wildlife. Uh, they can cause damage either to the gardens or to our house or to the trees. Mm -hmm. Some people find them scary. Yep. Uh, you know, and uh, there are some people that they just they don't want them around. They're smelly. With skunks, you know if you get skunks around. Cause they Actually, as a chemist, I don't find odor skunk that bad. I've well, worked with some, worse. You know, it's different people have yep. different mm -hmm. factory uh, yeah. cells, and uh, they might hurt other family members or if we've got livestock. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. there may be some other reasons. And you see that uh, that bottom picture. Uh, that's right at my house. Uh, I've got a beaver that decided that they wanted that little ash tree. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, they go through every once in a while and clip out all the, the ash trees. So it's now your beaver lives in, the, is, lives in the pond next door? Yeah. 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 So the, we'll go through uh, a few slides about, so why are they here? Uh, they're looking for just like people. They're looking for food and water and cover space and how that space is arranged. And different species have different needs. Uh, and each you know, uh, type of situation is spe can be species specific. And it can vary. Their needs can vary by sex, too, yep. uh, especially the, the uh, we have does. Springtime. A lot of times you'll see the the ponds will be near, uh, will be with them, and they have special needs, uh, you know, to keep the ponds uh, mm -hmm. protected while they are out and about. And age, you know, babies uh, require different uh, habitats than adults yep. many times. And time of year. Uh, we have a, a lot of uh, animals hibernate or uh, 
they might not be in complete hibernation, but they're, they uh, are snoozing uh, during the winter time, and others are very active. Yeah, just take a look at my seed bill in the winter. <laughs> about 80 pounds a week. Oh, there. So every place, uh, whether it's in our yards or the gardens or the, the woodlands, can provide some type of habitat for some type of wildlife. Uh, and uh, some places might be a better fit for some species, uh, might be more attractive to some species. And some places might be a, a poor fit or, or detract from uh, uh, animals that we want to see or wildlife that we want to see. When we're thinking about um, damage in a garden or any place, it's like total elimination of a, a wildlife species is not possible. Yeah. It's not realistic. Uh, so we need to think about, well, what can you live with? And this is a hosta plant that uh, is right next to my house. And uh, You've got deer, don't you? Yes. They, it's, well, it's like candy to them. Oh, Hostas yeah. are like candy. So it's like, can you live with that amount of damage? Well, that amount you probably could. That, that's not bad. Back. Even when they totally cut back. it down. That's what fences are for. They're going to come back. Yeah, ours just, they just chew almost to the ground. There's like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's that's right now. She, she, there's a dough it. that she comes back and she cleaned it up. <laughs> and if we're attracting different species, this is right on my deck. This is right outside the window, and there's a bird feeder nearby. Uh, so if you're going to be feeding songbirds, you may be attracting predators of those songbirds. And we oh. talked about that's the natural scheme of things. Mm -hmm. You're providing food for that predator. And uh, you know, that, that uh, hawk doesn't, you know, figures, hey, this is you know, a nice place to perch. My food's coming by. Uh, is that something that, that uh, you know, you're willing to work with? Uh, so think about what species are on your, what you want to see. And uh, you might also think about your neighbors. Uh, because there may be species that your neighbors really don't want to see nearby, and if you're attracting them, uh, it can uh, cause some problems. So, thinking about what to attract or what to deter. Um, these are things to think about. Uh, you know, what can we do to attract wildlife, and what can we do to deter them? Habitat modification is top on both of those. Mm -hmm. So if we provide food or if we take food away, if we provide shelter or take shelter away, uh, you know, that can either be an attractant or a deterrent. Providing water, uh, Lori's going to be talking about uh, water in a minute. Uh, providing natural uh, food or, or supplementation, uh, the amount and location of the food and stuff. Supplementation uh, will determine how much of an attractant it is. For deterrents, uh, there are repellents. There's odor repellents, there's taste repellents, there's noise, light. Uh, there's also barriers. You mentioned barriers for the, the clusters. So we'll, we'll talk about this. So attractants, we mentioned food, and it's better to provide natural food when possible. You know, grow different crops. Um, if you're trying to attract deer instead of feeding grain, uh, cut down some of the brush in your area or something like that. Uh, I've got some pictures of that later on. Um, for bird seed, you can provide uh, you know, supplemental feed that way too. Uh, shelter or cover, we've got bird houses and uh, just got a gift of the birdhouse here. And each bird has different requirements for the size of the hole of the birdhouse. Uh, and if you're trying to attract bluebirds, you don't want to have a perch because other birds. I was told not to have a perch on any feeder. Yep. Well, and sometimes uh, predators can get in there. Yeah, yeah that's what I, what I read. Yep. And we've actually got a, a fact sheet on attracting birds. Or 
we'll give the uh, links to. And you can take those comments. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, providing water and just space. You know, you don't want to have um, a real closed in area, but if you provide uh, shrubs or something like that for, for birds to come to, uh, they're more apt to, to hang with. I just put a water bowl out the other day. Well, during the winter time, I put my uh, Christmas tree up, so near the where we're feeding them, and that yeah. way they have a place that they can cover yeah. while they go to the the feeder and the hawk doesn't. Get them. <laughs> so it's you know providing them uh, you know some space and everything. Well, part of my problem is I've got that big field behind me. Well, you know, the grasses and legumes, that's that's what some wildlife are going for. Yep. So you're providing uh, food for herbivores, that's the, the uh, grass and forbs eating uh, animals. Uh, also, you're providing cover for ground nesting birds. And I don't, you don't mow it quite often, very often, do you? I'm once not the a one year, who mows, I say. Uh, once a year in August. Uh, my whole place is, is mowed, mm -hmm. and I tell them no more than every two weeks because of yeah. this. But well, I'd like to go even longer, yeah. but since I'm not controlling that and the height, it's like... Well, if you're thinking about ground nesting birds, you can't mow yeah. from May until August. Yeah, but see, up in the back, it's all weeds anyway, only about this high. Yeah. Yeah. And the, uh, the grass is not the greatest stuff, but the yeah. way I look at it, if I had golf course type grass, I, I wouldn't even want to walk. Yeah. Well, it's it's just if you leave it taller and longer, yeah. the place in the back might cost you less and it might provide some cover for it. It's the same thing when they move the whole thing and I've already asked them. Okay. Uh, so flowers and seeds uh, can be uh, feed for many species, especially for uh, insects too. Mm -hmm. But attracting mammals, you can do wildlife plantings. And we actually have a, a fact sheet on uh, wild apple trees for wildlife. Uh, although we get questions, you know, the deer are eating my, my trees. So it's like, okay. if you want to attract deer, you could plant the apple trees, but realize they're going to cause damage. Oh, yeah. Uh, putting legumes in your lawn, and there are many other reasons why you might want to have legumes uh, growing in your lawn. Uh, but for uh, mammals, they, they like to eat. No, um, clover are legumes too, yes. aren't they? Um, I'm loaded with clover. Yep. That's good. Yep. And this is a, a big point. No grain or hay for uh, deer. They can't really digest it, and people insist on feeding it to them. Once they get used to it during the winter, then you have to continue feeding them all winter long. Yeah. A better choice is to cut down some of the smaller trees so the deer can browse, and that way their gut stays acclimated. To natural feed. See, uh, see, I never intended to feed the deer. It was just basically to feed the birds. And as you face the house, the tree off to the right, which is not going to be too much longer anyway. But I got an area in there where the grass is shot. Then I throw quite a bit of seed down in the winter um, every morning. But that's for the squirrels, the birds, everybody. And then the deer came along. But then remember, I'm also on the run from the river up to way behind the airport. Well, so another thing, uh, I used to live in Sedac. Yeah. And there was a section of the road of a mile long that I talked to a game warden once, and they picked up a hundred deer carcasses. And that's because people on both sides of the road were feeding. Yeah. And so the deer would go to one place to eat, and cross the road and go to the other place, and they get nailed. And uh -huh. the game warden said they pro there were probably twice as many uh, deaths that they didn't make up. Because once now the grass is up. I'll watch them. I haven't seen them for us. So it's basically at night, and, and some of the seed I put up by the tree isn't even eaten. So I'm okay, I'm, I'm already cutting them way back. So I, you but know, a suggestion might be yeah. to try to feed those animals in another place, a higher place, some place that the yeah. deer can't get. It. But at the same time, I've also watched them come through and they'll just bypass my place and just keep yeah. going out back. There's a, there's a trail up to the airport anyway. Okay, so. Attracting songbirds. People uh, love to attract songbirds living near the house. They're controlling insects and they're pretty uh, to look at, nice to, to hear. In the garden, they can cause damage to crops. Red winged red -wing blackbirds can cause severe damage to grain crops. Uh, and sometimes they hit windows of your house. Uh, 
and there are some things you can put on big picture windows yeah. so they they realize that they can't uh, fly through it but you know glass reflects the uh, sky and they think it's just the sky and they go, that's what I get. See on the uh, big plate glass window in the front it's got that you know the cross hatching a wood mm -hmm. piece of decoration and hanging up from almost every section I've got some kind of the, the, um, some uh, patriotic thing I've got hung up and uh, all kinds of stuff that yep. gets hung up and they, so they, they still hit yeah. it. Yeah. That's why putting something on the outside of the glass to break up that reflection. Oh, oh I see. Okay. Okay, we talked about habitat modification again, what species, and we do have a fact sheet on uh, bird feeding basics too that uh, has a lot of this information, the specific feeds. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you can provide. Uh, again, providing food, cover, and water. Uh, natural is better, but we can supplement it. And uh, in our flower gardens, considering the seasonality of the flowers and when the pods will be available. Uh, and Laurie is going to talk a, bit, a little bit more about bees and butterflies. Uh, having trees and shrubs, again, I mentioned I use my Christmas tree during the winter to provide cover. Uh, it also provides a place, uh, you know, if it's really rainy, or if it's super hot out, uh, uh, or the cold weather in winter, it gives them some protection and protection from predators. Uh, it can block wind if you have a, a feeding area and you notice your feeders are going back and forth, <laughs> providing uh, trees or something uh, to break that wind. Is, is helpful. Um, so you can provide seeds, nuts, berries, fruits, depending on the uh, birds that you're, or the animals you're trying to attract. So, so one of the things um, that I hear a lot of, and I understand why, caterpillars can be a little creepy crawly for some people, especially if they land on you and you didn't realize it. But the thing that I like to remind folks is that um, caterpillars are the superfood for birds, mm -hmm. and um, they cannot feed their young the seeds, so they need those caterpillars to rear their hatchlings until they are able to uh, consume seeds as well. Um, native plants are the preferred food for caterpillars, you know, and some are species specific. Um, but it's really important to remember that if you do see a few holes in your plants out in your garden where the caterpillars have had a lunch, that's okay. Everybody's doing their job. Um, it, when Donna talked, uh, showed the picture about the hostas, you know, and talked about how much damage is acceptable, a lot of times, um, you know, you have to take a look at the amount of damage and is it acceptable. Um, you know, when we think about um, some of our key plants like our oaks and things like that for our caterpillars. Um, we need to be mindful of those and that's a good resource that we don't think about because it's just so big. Yeah. You know, oak trees are so big. But um, they are the native, um, native plants are that preferred food and then a lot of times the pollinators, um, even though they choose the native plants over others, they will go to other plants you have available. But this is just a reminder that the natives are the are the favorites. Well, speaking about natives, I planted from seeds well, a couple of years ago three um, milkweed, orange milkweed, well, you know, the, the, the pretty ones. They got about this tall, and I noticed one day the leaves were being stripped up, up, up in front of the greenhouse. I took a look, I gently picked up the leaves, and I had two minor caterpillars. So I moved them to bigger ones. Mm -hmm. And then next day is they were getting stripped. Even for, so I wound up losing them because the caterpillars had stripped them, mm -hmm. really stripped them. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got a lot of milkweed in my yard, too, yeah. the wild milkweed. I don't, I don't have a lot of um, data or art specific articles, but um, I have been to a few talks where some folks are recommending to mow your milkweed so that the, you keep getting a tender leaf supply. Oh. Um, I don't know. I don't think there's any hard and fast study that's been done on it, but it's something to think about. Um, and then water sources. Um, so 
So sizes and types, there are all kinds of different ones. Um, it can be everything from a puddle to a bird bath, um, artificial ponds, or even if you're lucky enough to have a natural pond. But the running water also is a very nice sound and it's very enticing. Um, and it just um, is a great place to observe what kind of wildlife you have because they're going to be drawn to that for sure. And we all need water, whether it's mm -hmm. us or our insects, you know, the mammals, everyone wants that water. So this is one that's um, a really fun project to do. It's a butterfly puddling area that you can make yourself. And um, super, super easy. This is just a terracotta saucer with some gravel um, and the rocks, of course. So that's for um, the butterflies and other insects to land on yeah. so that they are not having to try and it, they cannot hover and, yeah. and drink. So this is an easy thing to construct. It's an easy thing to keep um, available. And the for question of terracotta, is the outside glazed at all or just leave it intact? In this particular one, it is not. Okay. But um, if you were to do a the top of a bird bath that's that same shape mm -hmm. that is glazed, that's going to stay wetter longer. This yeah. is going to dry out much much faster. Um, and of course, this will provide the minerals as well um, that the butterflies like to have. If you add, you can add some sand. Um, and if you choose to do just a little puddling area like this, if you have Maybe a low place in your yard yeah. that you know you can keep water in pretty easily. Like if you were out there filling up, you know, your waterers or whatever. Yeah. You know, you could just hit this with the hose and keep that wet. But you can see how the butterflies just yeah flock to it and just. I had also read in some of the magazines, I uh, take some uh, sponges and put them in there mm -hmm. with uh, different things. At least they can land on those and get more. So. It's key to provide something that they can land on. Yeah. And also, if you're doing, you know, a man-made type of structure for their water, you can also position it where it's most advantageous for them. So if you can put it within 200 feet of like a garden area where you know you know they're going to be feeding. Yeah. Um, that way they don't have to fly as far to go back and forth okay. to forage for food and then get a drink. Everything okay. is within their area, okay. but they benefit. From it, um, if it's at least within 200 feet. Okay, now as, as far as the water goes, just plain water, nothing special I have to add? Just plain water. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, as Donna said, um, I like to talk about <laughs> gardens that are pollinator friendly. That's my favorite. That's my, my choice. This um, photo here was taken by one of our Master Gardener volunteers, Alan Amioka, and um, he just takes yeah. fabulous photos. I realized I didn't put his little credit on there, so I want to make sure I say that out loud. Um, but again, going back to those host specialists, when um, we have, like the monarchs, for example, they have to have the milkweed. So we can be aware of those types of needs of the animals we're trying to attract. If we really want monarchs to come into our garden, but we have no food source for them, and um, there are not many really monarchs coming up this far anymore than were there. Um, I, I don't have any statistics on it, but I really think that with so many folks aware of it and so many folks providing habitat yeah. and milkweed, I, I have to think that they're going to, you know, oh. increase a bit. Um, yeah. when I, I think I've seen more uh, on Facebook. Yeah. Somebody oh. sees a monarch. Oh. And there, there are a number of libraries and school groups that um, are hatching monarchs and doing that science project. Yeah. And so I know I'm seeing more at my house. I know we're seeing more at our office in Penobscot County. So um, I think the awareness is increasing and the numbers are increasing. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be putting in some other um, perennials this year. I mean, from Glen Farm with Brenda and Lee that will be good for a lot of these, uh, you know, the birds and some of those other insects. So. And that's, the, that's the, the best part, is they can do double duty. Mm -hmm. they, they, when you support that biodiversity and you keep um, everyone in the food chain happy all the way from the native plants and then the native insects are happy, 
and then the native mammals are happy, and then everyone is um, balanced. Mm -hmm. um, when we're um, planning for butterflies or bees or moths, uh, by the way, um, Pollinator uh, Appreciation Month is in June, and there's a Moth Appreciation Month, and that's in July. I just heard about that. There's a whole week devoted to moths, but um, providing um, food, water, shelter, and safeguarding their habitat um, goes a long way to attracting the type of um, things you want in your garden. Um, again, the nectar and the, the plants that we're providing, they do prefer natives so whenever you can plant a native species that is best. Um, planting the leeward side of a buffer. Um, moist wet areas, again that depends on number one what you're trying to attract, um, but keep in mind all of us need water. And this um, photo that I have in here, this is a pollinator friendly garden um, in western Maine. And it's right near, on the other side, you can't see it, but on the other side, there's a huge parking lot. And that's why this is one of my favorite gardens, is because they took a very sterile area that was just all lawn and fields that led to a path to go walking in nature. And they, I, I feel like they took and added nature here. And it's a very nice touch to um, soften the parking lot. And it's, it's not a huge, huge garden, and it's very long and rectangular. So you can create a, a habitat just about anywhere. Um, of course, seasonal considerations. Um, summer, there's, they need, as always, food and cover, um, especially for the insect habitats. Um, fall, a lot of the mammals, they need that dense food to prepare for their migration or their hibernation the upcoming season that's going to be a big change for them going into winter. Um, of course, in winter, we're providing um, winter food. Actually, I think I said that wrong. I think I read that slide a little wrong. We're not going to necessarily provide a supplemental food. Like but you we, provide plants. Yeah, OK. Um, and that become more palatable um, with freezing. Um, we know that some <laughs> of our, our mammals have already put aside their nuts or acorns and they're, they're storing them, so they do have that. One thing that um, I didn't mention before, but I wanted to, was I talked later on about um, not cutting back all our gardens, not doing a thorough cleanup in the fall, yeah. you know, leaving that for nesting habitat. But also, if you think about it, there are some plants that, you know, that may be a seed source. You know, when you see that winter interest in your garden, like we yeah. like to say, that might be a food source. Yeah, a, well. That's one of the things I was thinking of. In front of my greenhouse, which will never be used as a greenhouse, I can't do heat, I'll have a 30 feet, up, 24 feet wide. It's with that length of greenhouse going out 30 feet, and I have the last. 50, less half it to be tilled, and I just really start planting. Um, but I was thinking with the, I know with the cone flowers, and I guess the black-eyed susans, you don't deadhead it, just leave it for the birds to, yeah. 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 and that's a great reason. I didn't do anything last year. I even had the tomatoes and everything else still sitting in the garden, but uh, I never got there, you know, I finished up my sister's house, and a few days later, the ground was like a brick. Yeah. And like, for instance, the joe pie weed, that will provide the hollow stems, can provide um, an overwintering site, for insects as well, so if we keep those up. How high does that else. get? The Joe Pie? Yeah. Um, if it's happy, it I believe it goes to four and a half feet to four to four and a half feet, I believe, but I can double check. Does that. it get too big sideways? If it's happy, <laughs> um, when it's happy, um, I have I have a spot that I just love because it is so happy and it's just but it, it just took over a spot that nothing else was going to, you know, yeah. really work there unless I put a great deal of effort into mm -hmm. it. So I'm happy with it. Is it about four and a half feet tall? It could get tall. I, well, mine is stunted, apparently. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Yeah. And they're going to put in um, a couple of New England asters, and I've been reading in some of the magazines. You can keep clipping them back oh, every few weeks until the beginning of July. This way, I'll keep them 
maybe a little smaller because it's six feet plus high. I'm so happy to hear you're, you're putting in asters. Yeah. Those fall um, food supplies are crucial. So, mm -hmm. uh, oh, I was just I want talking to have about colors as much of the season as I can. Yeah, they're gorgeous, yeah. and they're so late. They go so late, you know, I depending know. They on start the type late, of fall that's the problem, we're, but, yeah. we're having. Um, and like I said, leaving the garden cleanup until spring. Um, if you're like me, this this is a challenge to adjust to. Um, but but um, it's worth it in, in the long run. And then on the flip side, though, um, you do have to be patient not only in the fall, because you're not doing the fall cleanup, but in the spring as well, because you want to wait as long as possible before you do that um, cleanup, because we're looking for those warmer temperatures when the insects can, can um, be out and about and yeah. don't need that protection. Um, non-living components for wildlife um, so nest boxes um, bee houses insect hotels we, these are all kind of really fun cool things that have become really popular that, was, yeah I was good, gonna yeah. get this to you and then I'm gonna get get them um, I'll take this on it but um, and this is the birdhouse that she was talking about earlier actually I don't know where the camera is it's right oh, there. there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's no perch. No perch. So oh. that's that's ideal. And this is for bluebirds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's easy open. It's, I don't know how it opens. She needs to be either the bottom or the back. The bottom, that little key. Oh. The metal thing. The metal thing in the back. I don't on the front. On the front. Mm -hmm. In the back. Oh, right there. Oh, this is fancy. Does it just twirl? Oh, there we go. Look at that. So that would be really easy to clean out. Yeah. So that's pretty so awesome. When does that get done uh, probably during the summer when the family is out? Well, it, or the fall? I definitely would do it in the fall. Okay. Um, I don't know. I think I personally would be a little hesitant to do it um, because if they have, if it's a great year and they're doing two hatches. I was good about that, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I would. I think I would wait. Yeah. Um, just me personally. I don't have any. Yes, I did. I know robins have two and three broods because they're such high mortality. But I didn't know some of these others did. I would. I would err on the side of caution. Okay. I wouldn't want to clean it out until I was sure yeah. they yeah. were gone. That's why I said you know late summer or in the yeah. fall. But just didn't look like Maybe when you're months. not doing your fall cleanup. Because <laughs> <if you're not laughs> <laughs> I, I almost said when you're doing your fall cleanup, that's a great reminder. Go ahead and yeah. do it then. But, um, so this is a bee house. And it's beautiful. And um, one thing to note is there are all kinds of different sizes because we want different um, apartment dwellers in our bee apartment. And they're all going to want different sizes. Yeah. But these are great. Um, How high up and where do you hang the, the bee houses? So I have one on the ground, oh. for example. Um, and it, it's right in the garden. Um, but I've been reading some literature lately that's recommending if you can mount it up higher yeah. um, on the side of a building, as long as it has protection, that's a better option. But keep in mind too, if we're doing if we're doing something super handmade, like for instance, we're taking some cans and we're going to roll these papers up into different sizes and we're going to make different colors so the bee no which apartment is theirs oh. because they're gonna they're gonna hone in on these different colors. Now when you say different paper you don't mean construction paper do you? So I, mean, so I have so all kinds of different paper in here. Yeah. I have um, copier paper I think. That's what I was thinking would that be what you want. I have some notebook paper I yeah. have um, this is more of a card stock. Yeah. This is scraps. I was trying to be really mindful of reusing all kinds of materials. That sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this this would go right on the ground for example. Oh. So that could go right on the ground. The, the important thing is to try to keep it from getting wet. Now keep in mind the paper ones are not as durable as say yeah. the <laughs> bamboo and the wood and like that. But you can also make these, um, I don't think I have any pictures in the slide, you can also um, make these like say you took, say these were bricks, yeah. left, leftover bricks you had instead. And then in, you wanted to put in some sticks or some stems that were hollow. 
all those kind of things they can use as well. So you can make this with lots of different materials. Um, but the main thing is you want to make sure that um, they're, they're staying dry. Mm -hmm. So for this, I would probably make sure this was like under something else, you know, oh. it's going to protect it a yeah. bit. Um, these, um, you can make these at home too, like out of a block of wood. You can just take your drill and drill mm -hmm. the holes. And then all I did was put um, a little cedar shake of shingle on the top just to make sure that the water flowed off of it. So you don't probably or that at all? Um, I don't know, um, but it would not, I don't think it would hurt it at all. I would not do anything oh, to yeah. keep it. Yeah. The outside would that's not what, Yeah, that's what I think, the outside, yeah. yeah. It would probably last a lot longer yeah. too. Um, but those are all things that are just fun that you can do to, um, that'll really go a long way. You mm -hmm. know, you've just provided shelter. You've already done a, a mud puddle, a butterfly puddling area, so now yeah. they have some water sources. Um, you're putting in asters, there's a native food source. Um, and earlier, Donna had talked about um, leaving space. And another way to think about leaving space is a lot of our ground nesting um, bees need ground. So we need to leave some barriers in our gardens as well because they, they can use that for reproduction. Um, and so it's really important that they have the bare areas where they can um, utilize. When I think about, um, I have a place in my backyard, it's unusually sandy. I don't usually have that because I have mostly clay, yeah. but it's very sandy and the grass doesn't grow there very well. And that's great because the, the bees just love to tunnel and make their their homes. And when we were talking about the fields earlier as well, that, that could be another um, area in the tall grass um, where the bees like to, to make their homes. I ran into a years ago in Southern Boston. I dropped off the car for service. They knew I was going to get the town forest and hiking in it. In a grassy area, I had to water a tree before I got back to the street. And uh, I got right into a yellow jacket. Mm. So, oh, I'm glad you mentioned I got nailed. So that's another thing when we were talking about, you know, we may attract something else when we're not sure. Yeah. Or when we're trying to attract something else. When I think of that, I always think of my hummingbird feeders. Mm -hmm. I, I want to feed them, but then I'm eating the yellow jackets. So, you know, that's a, to me, well, that's ants. the most um, immediate thing I always think of is when you when you attract something, it may or may not have been yeah. what you wanted. I hear the uh, hummingbirds now are in southern New England. Mm -hmm. well, I think you have that. In, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, sorry, I got off topic here. Um, dead trees, fallen trees, um, they can all be sources of shelter as well. Mm -hmm. um, rock piles, um, banks, and cliffs. Um, now the dust and grit um, and salt, I'm going to ask you, what am I forget to mention about that? Well, uh, the dust and grit is the same thing as you have an uh, area that's in the Oh, okay, okay, yeah. I want to make sure of that. Because some birds need to get some grit for their crop. Oh, I, I would think also when they want dust baths too. Yeah, that's another yeah. one. Okay. So, mm -hmm. yeah. No, I'm, this is, I want to make sure that you're what I do with my water bowls, I use the rubber water bowls, so as it gets cold and starts to freeze, I can just either turn them upside down, step on them, and twist them. Um, and I know it's black and water gets warm, but when I start putting my plants out, I have a little well, shelf type thing. I have to move it in such a way that it keeps the water out of the sun as long as possible. But I've also got a couple of those kids, uh, white picnic tables, so when I get that up and going, I can put the water under that. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Anything else I missed on there, Donna? No, I think there's another one. Oh, Peter's. Okay. Okay. Um, I jumped the gun by showing the nest box, but. <laughs> um, so, um, size, um, type, and location to the species that you're trying to attract. Uh, the size of the hole is crucial. Um, waterproof, that's, that's very important as well. Um, an overhang for protection and no perches. Um, 
Now, with bluebirds, it's 25 feet between the houses. Is that right? And then, no, for regular birds. And then it's 300 feet for bluebirds. But the, the thing is, well, it's because bluebirds don't like to be in a house next to another bluebird. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people put multiple uh, nest boxes, knowing that maybe every other one will be a bluebird. Oh. But don't expect everyone's going to be a bluebird. Mm -hmm. they might well, I've only seen one bluebird in the 17 years I've been here. Mm -hmm. yep. But I think they're more. Yeah, that's what I've been hearing, yeah. <coughs> and we have that birdhouse basics that has mm -hmm. all the mm -hmm. Bats. I love bats. I think bats are great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there's eight species in Maine. Um, the little brown myotis. Is that how you say it? And big brown myotis. I think that's how you say it. Um, and they're the most common in buildings that we get in buildings. But the good side is they love to eat insects. And they're also night pollinators, which is another oh. great thing. Um, and they have, they're really fun to watch. They have such a, an interesting flight pattern and the way that they can dip and dive. Um, do we have some? Oh, is, that, is there white nose syndrome in Maine or no? Yeah. I think there is. Okay. Yes. Um, didn't we have a slide in here, though, about how many cucumber beetles they can eat? Oh, sorry. Oh, good. <laughs> I was reading about it earlier, and I was like, oh, that's so awesome. Um, but to attract bats, um, the bat houses, um, there's lots of different sizes and shapes, um, but location, location, location. Um, again, Everyone needs water, so near water is helpful. And it could take several years. You, could, you need lots of patience. Uh, but these bad houses also provide an alternative to your attic, which is a good thing. But you can also visit this website, um, batcon.org. When I screened in uh, the porch of the cabin, I used to have an harmony. I used to watch the bats with the porch overhung the, uh, uh, the roof. And I'd get up on the ladder and just look at them. Beautiful little things. They look like they're very soft hair. Yeah. They just, you know, just kind of crawl back up and say, Sorry, guys, I'm not going to do anything to hurt you. And when the guys, um, the, the builders, uh, screaming in the porch, just said, Guys, I've got a couple bats there. Please don't fence them in. Be sure you get them out and don't hurt them. So he called me that night and said, you didn't have two. You had nine of them. I said, you got them all out. <laughs> and he said, don't worry. They're, they're gone. They're out and they're safe. Well, your homework assignment for everyone is to is to um, go to your search engine and find out how many cucumber beetles bats will eat. And it'll make us all happy. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> so uh, feeders, of course, there's lots and lots of styles and types out there. Uh, there's decorative and there's utilitarian ones, there, there's a big choice. But try to match the food to the species that you want to attract or support and keep coming around. Um, the black, black oil sunflower, there's thistle, which is Niger seed. Suet, um, I believe suet is primarily for the winter. I go through more in the summer. Yeah. I go through its cake about every two or three days in the winter for the last few weeks. But in the summer, the um, woodpeckers, Anybody else feeding the babies? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I planned on keeping it out on winter, but here they are. Eating. I said, okay, well, but they're fun to watch. The babies are as big as the parents. Mm -hmm. um, don't forget the nectar yep. sources. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, mealworms and clean regularly. Um, and if you have um, any questions, the uh, bulletin 7124 bird feeding, fe bird feeding basics, can't talk today, um, is helpful as well. So hummingbird reminders, um, they love tubular flowers, it, it goes along with their design. Um, they like single flowers. You can provide a supplemental nectar, it's one part sugar to four parts hot water ratio. Um, mix it and let it cool and always keep it clean. Um, and we were just talking about the migration online, you can follow that at hummingbirdcentral.com. 
And then we have the bulletin 7152, Understanding Ruby Throated Hummingbirds in Enhancing Their Habitat. And once again, I'm going to give a plug for providing native plants for them um, because they are dependent on a lot of native plants. Um, guideline deterrence, here we go. Um, modifying the habitat. If you reduce the, if you're trying to um, reduce the wildlife in your garden, in your yard, reduce the available cover. If they don't have that place to hide um, and seek shelter, that will help. You can use plant species or varieties that are a lot less appealing to them. Um, and for your garden, harvest your food crops, crops as soon as possible. Um, and you could plant, plant a, a lure crop to try to keep them away. Um, you never know. Um, I think that little guy is eating a strawberry right so this must be one of Donna's pictures. <laughs> Actually, it was somebody else's picture. Oh, okay. But I did have, uh, we did used to have trouble with the squirrels. Yeah. So repellents can either be from taste or smell. Um, you could plant plants that they don't prefer. Um, mammal repellents, um, putrescent egg solids, um, ammonium soaps, um, byram, Capsin, I did say the great capsicum. 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 Can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is hot pepper. Um, and human hair or bar soap. And just like I, I had trouble with squirrels and chipmunks going through my window boxes. Oh, okay. And so that's hot pepper. Well, I, I have a funny story about the hot pepper as well. Um, at one time in my landscaping career, um, we had um, unwanted animals that were picking the flowers, and um, one of the growers started made a hot pepper concoction. And that uh, doesn't have any effect on birds, does it? No, the birds can't don't have the same taste buds yeah. that mammals do. Yeah. So if they're eating the bird seed, you can mix hot peppers in the hot pepper. Oh. I've tried the human hair. I've tried the uh, things like scram. Is it, the, is it the end of the slideshow or no? No. no. no all sorts Ew. of deterrents. <laughs> oh, I think maybe there's too many things open. Oh. Um, <laughs> Keychain login. I'm not going to mess with your. There. That was a keychain yeah. thing. Yeah. So scare devices. This is we're trying to deter um, animals from our, our garden house area. <coughs> Excuse me. And these are all different types of things. Uh, the upper right. Uh, that's actually a CO2 cannon. That if you have a large planting of strawberries or something else that you've got to drive birds away, uh, it goes up at irregular intervals. And we mentioned something about, uh, you know, be aware of what your neighbors will tolerate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't tolerate those very well. <laughs> you know, so if you have neighbors, you may not want to do that. Uh, but certainly scarecrows are like a, a long time thing that people have used. Do they birds? The birds actually do get used to the scarecrows, don't You have to move them. Oh, okay. Uh, that's why this, you know, it looks like the items can move a little bit. Yeah. And you move the location too, so yeah. it makes them think that it's a person out there. Uh, you can have the, you've seen the balloons with the ice spot on them, that's to, uh, you're mimicking uh, owls. Uh, the mylar strips, that's what the bottom thing is. And uh, when we had cassette tapes, it's just like a cassette tape. Uh, you string it out there, and the birds see that glinting, yeah. and so that they don't like that. So mm -hmm. they're going to drive them away. Uh, having a radio, motion detector, and sound, and lights and water. Uh, pet dog, or you see over in the, the right, uh, 
is a thing that's plugged in and uh, it's advertised as a, a sonic um, device that's supposed to scare uh, mice out of your house or scare mm -hmm. you name it and the claim is that it will scare them out. Uh, when they first came out I was in a place that and I had my dog with me. The dog could hear it and I could hear it. And it's oh. it's not that you hear it, it's that it's uncom it was uncomfortable for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think they thought, well that meant that the wildlife would find it uncomfortable and would vacate the spot. It doesn't work that way. I tried yeah. oil of peppermint and when I had my camp I was there this one day I just you know, swept up the floor, I was sitting on the porch eating my lunch and reading, and I could hear my uh, my mouse up in the uh, loft, little loft area of the addition. I said, okay, pal, it's time for oil of peppermint. And she must have called me every four-letter mouse word there was, <laughs> but she had a chance to go in and out. But I wasn't there enough. There was no one there at night. But uh, you know, oil of peppermint worked, but I, 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 Oil of peppermint elsewhere throughout the building, not not within the main part of the house. I don't know how that would affect the cats. And I had a lot of pet roads. You may have made a Z, and I, I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. But I have someone who gets in the walls here and there, and I, you know, bang on the walls and spray a little bit, and it'll stop for a while and back and forth. But I think that may be a red squirrel. Well, as far as birds go, I, I mean, we just read Fuzz by Mary Roach. You read that at all. Mm -hmm. But she talks about bird mitigation a lot in there. And a lot of what she says is that there's a lot of bird species, like especially there's sunflower farms that try to deter birds. And it ends up that the birds would eat 10% of the crop, but the insects that they, the birds eat, would eat 25% if the birds weren't there. Mm -hmm. So, how, how effective are some of these when it comes to crop yields? Like, is the like the cannon thing that goes on. Yeah, on. like the cannons uh, or like specifically trying to, to scare away birds before they habituate to the crop. Yeah. Like once they found out, oh, this, this is pretty tasty. <laughs> mm -hmm. The when the cannon goes off, they fly, but then they realize it's not off. It doesn't go off all the time, so they'll come back, and it's like it doesn't drive them away. But if you can start it before they habituate to mm -hmm. the crop. But do you end up with more insect damage because there's no birds there, or? If you're growing sunflowers for mm -hmm. the crop, you're probably spraying an insecticide to control. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. You know, they, they can't tolerate much loss. If it were just 10% loss, you know, then they tolerate yeah. birds. Uh, but we had trouble with cedar waxworms on our strawberries, and it's like a block came through did the damage and it decimated yeah. the first crop. And it was like a, a bloodbath. And, uh, you know, there, there was not much you could do because it's like, you know, if you close the door after the horse leaves. Yeah. It was one year I had some sunflowers from the black oil that had about so high, I had it in the front, uh, front of the house, and I had one um, that had the seed area about so big. A couple of days, I was just watching the bees sleeping oh, yeah, at night. Cool. Like, I probably could have had them, but I don't want to disturb them. I want them. Yeah. Okay, yeah. What's the name of that book again? It's Fuzz by Mary Mary Roach. Oh, sounds um, really interesting. Because I, I know China did, I believe it was in the 70s. They did a lot of bird mitigation, and one year they tried to kill every starling in China, and grasshoppers went crazy. And crop failures. And it, it just, a lot, from what she said and in the book, a lot of it is like, yeah. if, if you really go hard into bird mitigation, you end up with a lot more insects. Yeah. That yeah. Well, another option is just putting barriers. So protecting the crop, just the immediate vicinity, you know, fence, depending on what animal it is, fencing or netting. Uh, and, you know, it depends on the value of the crop. You know, if you've got a large field of oats, you're going to take some birds of damage, and you're not going to do much. But if you have just a small raised bed, uh, you know, you want to protect it from the, the, the deer. Um, individual trees can be protected, you know, they have, uh, they're getting more and more like specialized uh, netting that you can put over your, your trees to protect them. Uh, there are also uh, baffles and sticky substances that you can try to 
to protect um, plants. In the home garden, again, it's what can you live with? Uh, and this is a picture of a kind of a neat setup using PVC pipe. And I've, I've always been a fan of PVC in the garden. Uh, you don't have, you don't want to glue the joints because you want to be able to take it down and store it. Uh, but this is just a, a framework made out of PVC pipe, and uh, that's the nylon netting uh, suspended over it. So you can drop it down over it. Your uh, desirable plants, you can lift it up easily to harvest or, or weed. Uh, but it, it makes a, a pretty neat type of thing. Electric fence, if you've got deer, sometimes electric fence can work and, and you've got all sorts of directions on how to do it. The key with electric fence is to have a good ground. If you don't have a good ground, it's not going to give it a good zap. Uh, you can put little pieces of foil with peanut butter on it so the deer touch fence and know that that's what it is. Otherwise, they just hop over it. You know, if they see a wire, they'll hop over it. The barn I was at, the second barn I was at before I moved up here, uh, when Lydia put in the paddocks, she went in far enough apart so the horses couldn't lean over and play games. She had three strands, and we used to, the horses and I used to watch the deer that go from one paddock, fold themselves up, go between the second and third top two strands, fold themselves up, go right through the paddock, go out the back, just fold themselves up, the horses went. <laughs> Well, they, do, yeah. they do have uh, electric fence netting, and I don't have a picture of that here. Uh, but that prevents uh, the deer from going through. And they yeah. do have smaller holes so that woodchucks and, mm -hmm. and uh, raccoons can be kept out. It looks like a deer would be able to jump that. Picture they, though. It's because it's it's white. It's mm -hmm. noticeable. It's different, and that's you're keying in on it's different, and trying to get them to touch it because it's different. And then they get zapped. It's like, uh, but if if they had gotten in that garden ahead of time, and then you put the fence around it, it's mm -hmm. like, they can still jump over. Do you can jump pretty. Oh, they can jump eight feet. Yeah. yeah, but it's you've got to make them touch it so they know it's a fire. There is trapping, uh, catch and release, or lethal measures. Uh, if you're going to go the lethal. Uh, direction. You do want to contact game workers just to make sure. Uh, but there are no permits needed for moles, shrews, voles, mice, rats, chipmunks, chips, pork pines, or red squirrels. Um, there is open season on uh, four uh, species of wildlife, raccoon, skunks, uh, possum, and gray squirrel. I didn't put deer up there. It's open season on deer. Um, if you're going to uh, translocate some of these, meaning you're going to live catch and then try to move them, uh, the suggestion is don't to, don't move the raccoon or stuff more than uh, five miles away. <laughs> and they have found if you try moving them, you're moving them to a new location, they're going to have to fight with the, the resident wildlife, and it doesn't go well. No. So it's like. Do you do the catch and release? Yeah, that's why the mouse is a house pet until she's yeah. she's gone and now she won't make it. So it's like that might not be a, a good choice. Why the trapping skunks is fun. <laughs> You've never done oh, yes. I've done it. Yeah. Yeah. No. The farm that we had in Sebec, we probably <laughs> trapped at least ten. Yeah. And I got very adept with it. And it got so uh, I was heading into work one morning, my husband then said, Why don't you take care of the skunk? <laughs> and it's like the deal is you set the live trap and you have to put a cloth over yeah, it, you and you have it so over. you just toss it over it, put it in the back of the truck, ran it down the road, and uh, got it out, opened it, and you have to put your hand right in, opened it up, set it down. He didn't come out, so I had to shake it like a ketchup bottle. I was Still, just I was just got one of those run clamps away. and just like <laughs> clamped it open and just like left it. For 20 minutes. Oh, no, oh, no. You gotta, you gotta look dangerously. <laughs> they're afraid of you. They want to get away. Yeah. And if they're running away, they're not gonna spread you. <laughs> That's her story, and she's yeah. sticking to it. The time like, they're gonna spread <laughs> is when you first come out. 
Yeah. I would always like, just put like coveralls on and like a ski mask yeah. and stuff just in case. Goggles. Yeah. <laughs> well, we had one get in the basement of our house yeah. one uh-huh. night and sprayed. And it was like. Did you have a dog sorry. then too? Oh, yes. We had oh. two dogs. But anyway. But the first thing, before you decide what you're going to do, you want to figure out what it is that's out there. And now they've got all these neat little cameras you can use for surveillance and yeah. figure out, you know, mm-hmm. is it a raccoon or what is it? Uh, and is, then, that a, is that a pot? Is that one a possum or no? Yes, I believe it is. That's, that's the easiest. We don't really have them here, but those are the easiest ones to lie. I understand trap. they're here yeah. now. I've, I've heard people coming. seen them, but they're yeah. not. But if you live trap one of them, when you go up to it, most of the time it just passes out. <laughs> and then you can just pick it up and take it out. And That's my kind of trapping. Yeah. <laughs> you know? my, my kind of trapping is seeing how close I get to the animal to play with it. <laughs> well, but the idea is, you know, figure out what it is you've got. And if you don't want to take care of it, you can contact the wildlife services. They do have um, courtesy trappers um, that will Take the animals. Rodents, and we've got a few slides here because, well, just today uh, on Facebook, somebody had it was actually rats in their animals. And it's like rodents seem to be an issue. They, wherever there are people, uh, rodents find sufficient food and cover and everything so that so, uh, they can habitate for people really easily. We, we used to have groundhogs yeah. that would try to dig into our in-ground pool at our last house, oh, and I was constant. I, and they're really hard to trap. Mm-hmm. Well, there's all their food is there. Yeah, <laughs> they just eat the grass. So what do you lure yeah, them with? So I used to, I used to have to, I used to have to shoot like 20 groundhogs a year. Oh, no. Otherwise, they would burrow. They were getting close to like burrowing into the pool, mm-hmm. and it was not a good. Situation. They like it there. I don't. I know yeah. some other people that have that same problem. It's just. But if you if you identify that you've got some rodents, you put those little trails you can see, especially in the springtime. The snow My squirrels. Or some of the rodents in there. Now I have um, a friend of my house with that dead barbivite. Is that's that's for now for the convenience of my critters. So they've all between uh, raccoons. Squirrels, birds, chipmunks, everybody you know, up and down. It's, it's, it's deader than dead, but I'm going to leave it. Now, just to the bottom there, when, as the snow bank started to go, it came off the roof. I thought that the ice was about this far above the ground. It was hollow, and then when all that melted, I've got tracks through the grass, I mean, trails about this wide. There's a four by four separating the garden area from the grass. Someone's tunneled under there, too. Mm-hmm. Is that a weasel? I'm not sure. Weasels, I thought, were smaller than that. Yeah, that's when it comes up. Uh, that's why you need, to get a, you need to get a trail cam. You know, yeah, but, but I need a computer for that, don't I? No, you do. Well, you can, you can usually you can usually just play the the images on the screen of the camera. Depends on the type that you. Yeah, have. Uh-huh. but for the for the most part, it has a little screen when you open it up. Yeah. And you can just go through. Because I don't the have a computer. I don't have a um, mm-hmm. smartphone. So yeah, they have a that stuff. Ten, or they have a sense, uh, motion sensor, so it doesn't mm-hmm. the camera doesn't start until something. Moves. Yeah. But anyway, if you got rodents, uh, you know we talked about providing cover for them. Well, don't provide cover for them. <laughs> you know, mow and weed whack around buildings and remove if you get any clutter. Uh, and then every year I hear people say, I'm going to put mothballs out. Mothballs are not an acceptable um, well, pesticide. They are pesticide, and they're for use in enclosed areas for moths. So outside, is that an enclosed area? No. Is it moths? No. So it's not an approved. Yeah, but it, uh, when I was hiking the Appalachian Trail in Vermont, I was told because of such a huge porcupine uh, population up there, if you left your car on the, at the parking lot at the side of the trail, you figure you're going to buy at least one tire and probably fan belts because they chew anything you, you touch and it's salt on it, they're going to chew it. So uh, the woman I was hiking with one time, we just ran uh, mothballs right around the edge of the car, no problem, and we picked them up when we left. After that, we got smart. We managed to uh, park three miles down the road 
and so when that you know, all was up there. Or it may have been somebody had taken care of that copper time. I know this was all along that hundred mi over hundred miles in the mine. But they're still it's not approved to use them outside. I do carcinogens anyway. Yeah. Well, anyway. But anyway, I had mentioned the electronic devices are not affected either so either mothballs or electronic devices are affected. Traps are and these are for rodents, rodent bait. So there's all sorts of things you can try, but something that's sticky and will stick to the, the trigger is good. Is that a piece of cheese on that rat trap, or are you just blocking it? Which one? The center one? On the right one. On the right one? I think it's a post-it note. Oh, it's a post-it note. It's a post-it note. Yeah. We're trying not to we're promote not a particular to brand. Well, you're, you're, you're showing Victor yeah. in the middle one, so yeah. I, didn't, I thought it might be like a slice of, uh, <laughs> somebody else's, of like a crash single or something. <laughs> somebody else's picture was trying to be yeah. good, and I wasn't as good. <laughs> uh, but my preferred Victor trap now is the upper right one. Mm -hmm. It's very, very easy once you catch a mess. They're very easy to dislodge. And if you have a lot, that's what the lower left is. It's a uh, five-gallon bucket mm -hmm. uh, liquid mm -hmm. and ramps that go up. And that's uh, like a can with peanut butter on a, on a uh, wire. And they get on there and fall. But you need to check them on. And rodenticides, uh, a lot of people, you know, they get rats and mice and say, I want something to kill them. I want some rodenticide. Well, you have to be careful of the off-target uh, of the off-target animals that could be affected. Um, and they're, oh, okay. right. because anytime you have a, a rodent that has eaten some poison, they become food for something higher up. It's not a quick death. And the old barn I was at, they had cats for rodent control. Um, and we lost cats from it. Yeah. Well, so that's it's why a lousy this, death. Yeah. Well, the, the lower left shows a uh, thing that you can use to put the bait out yeah. so non target animals won't get into it. It's so mm -hmm. actually a PVC pipe again. But there are baits that have been out for over 20 years that the animal that eats it, it, it ends there. So if another animal gets that, one that's been baited and eats it, it doesn't go any farther. Mm -hmm. So they're not a, a rodenticide, they're not a good choice. No. So we've got some uh, pictures for specific animals that we might want to uh, manage in the garden. Uh, groundhogs, uh, you know, we talked about trying to live with their damage and that too. But in your case, it's, it can be very difficult. Uh, fencing, to try to prevent them from climbing or burrowing, uh, you know, it's not eliminating cover, but they're eating the grass that's out there. Uh, planting an alternative or a trap crop is like your garden still tasty. You can live trap and again move at least five miles away. Uh, there are these um, frightening devices that you can put on a, a garden hose and it's a motion detector and it'll shoot out a, a little thing. Uh, but if you've got good garden prep on water pressure, that might be an option. But again, they may get used. Squirrels. You know, we mentioned they aren't fun to watch. And that is not a squirrel feeder. That is a bird feeder, but you know, they're still fun to watch. Um, if we mentioned in the yard you can use capsaicin as a, a repellent, a taste repellent. I could have put that uh, bird feeder up uh, and have baffles around it or trim the branches around it so that squirrels can't get to it as easily. Uh, if you have squirrels in your buildings, the way my house is built, they haven't gotten in, but sometimes they can get in really easily into the attics and everything like that. So you have to exclude them, uh, try to find out where they're going, and, and cover it usually with uh, hardware cloth or something like that. Skunks, yes, we had a skunk discussion. Uh, 
trying to, to keep any pets indoors so they don't get sprayed. Sometimes that works, sometimes not. Uh, they are relatively easy to, to trap in a live trap. I'm trying to remember what we use. I think it was tuna or something like that. Yeah, any kind of like spoil. We always use like spoiled lunch meat. Like anything <laughs> that's really gross. We'll something get that smells. Yeah. And meaty. meaty um, but uh, this time of year, we have people that are calling the office. It's either crows or, or um, uh, skunks are digging up their lawn. Well, they're eating the grubs, yeah. and it's like, is that bad? You know, they are tr they are controlling the grubs, and the recommendation now is instead of killing the grubs, just accept the damage and reseed those areas that have been turned up. And they actually By the time don't do that much damage. By the time you see it, it's like the damage is done. Yeah. So, you know, we see. Uh, but if you're gonna, if you're going to treat your lawn, uh, the timing is really super important because if you put your pesticide out when the grubs aren't uh, susceptible, it's not going to do any. Not gonna work. Woodpeckers. Uh, sometimes you'll see feeding holes. Um, you know, they're they're trying to get in there to eat some insects, and usually the tree is already dead because there are insects in the tree that the woodpeckers are going after. Sometimes they'll uh, have a nesting hole uh, if the tree is healthy. You know, it's okay. You don't want to. I wouldn't have a reason to uh, make them vacate that. Uh, but there are sap suckers that can drill holes if you see a whole bunch of holes in a row. And before, a couple of days ago, I would have said, you know, this is something you might be able to live with. I had a, a person contact us, and their uh, star magnolia tree, I think, has been killed. Uh, the sap it's like they ring, uh, they'll girdle the tree with those little feeding places. And they're doing this, uh, they're pecking those little holes so the sap oozes into the hole, and they're, they're eating the sap from the hole. And then that attracts insects, and the insects are eaten by plants. So it's like, well, uh, you can cover the trunk of the tree with either mesh or burlap to try to dissuade them if they haven't done as much damage. And there is a material called tangle foot that's sticky, and uh, they don't like to their feet stuck to them, so it drives them off. As far as that tangle foot goes, Will that, if they step in that, will that prevent them from being able to get away? Is it that sticky? Yeah. Or? Oh, okay. it's, it's tacky. It's like, okay. And snakes, uh, this is the first time we've mentioned snakes. And some people just don't like the look of them. They're creeped out by them. <laughs> but the thing is, they're insect and rodent control. <laughs> you know, they're, they're helping us. If you don't want them in your immediate areas, again, trying to change the habitat. Uh, if you have wood piles or other debris around the house, clean it up. Uh, keep your grass trimmed really short. Uh, mulch to prevent any weeds from coming. Uh, you know, those are, are some options. But it's like, don't, you know, if you see one and other people in your household don't appreciate them, maybe you can just pick them up and move them so the other people don't see. My sister had a garter snake problem over her romantic house. These were long and they were fat. And I guess there must have been a nest under the porch. And they, you know, she'd be going up the steps and okay, okay she called the, the big one Ken down. She had to kind of very gently get him off the porch. And she always thought she'd see on the sill in the basement. She always in the corner of her eye. She always thought she saw something. She called me one day. I got a snake in the basement. I said, give me half an hour and I'll get that. Got me back five minutes later. I got him. I said, "Did he hiss at you?" He said, "Oh yes," but she was able to get him out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we used to have them in our house in Pennsylvania all the time, mm -hmm. and black snakes can climb yep. siding, so they would be like on the oh. second floor of the house. Mm -hmm. But it's just a black snake. I don't yeah. get it. But mm -hmm. just the thought of having the snake looking, in the house. They're looking for cover and they're yeah. looking for food, yep. and they think that's what you got. In the but house. there's no there's no poisonous snakes here though. Like there we, used to be. We had. Rattlesnakes and copperheads. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I was this far from stepping snakes. on a coil rattlesnake in Virginia. 
Yeah. But then uh, I was told way back in the western part of Maine, this is one with this is when I lived in New Hampshire, that there were um, Blue Mountain and another place over there was infested with them. Mm -hmm. And we were told when I lived in Conway that you don't have to worry about any poisonous snakes except in the uh, the two um, sand pits. One was connected to our development, the other one's up yeah. in the Redstone section of North Conway. They said, don't worry about them in the White Mountains. They said, you've got to be very careful yeah. because of all the building going on. They've just scooted yeah. them further up. Yeah. Well, here's a list of resources, and for people that are online, we can uh, put this list, I think, in the, the Facebook post. Uh, I will uh, point out the last item is a YouTube video. We have a, a two-hour program on rats and other burn control in the fire. If you really want to delve into all sorts of things, that's a nice one. So any questions? I came in a little late. Yeah, sorry, buddy. I didn't look at you. Well, there. <laughs> did we, uh, did you want something covered? Well, I saw mice and rats. We just developed a little mice problem, mice and mouse problem in the house. Mouse and mouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, if you noticed how the uh, traps were set, uh, it's real important to put them right up next to the, the uh, wall. Okay. Because they're running next gotcha. to the wall. That's how they're running. Okay. Uh, and have what the open the part, you know, so they're going to be going right through it. Ah, if you get the bait. Gotcha. Through through. What's in the bucket? What's that? Uh, that's just it's colored water, I think. No, I mean, uh, it's, they climb a little ladder there. And what's yep. in the middle of the bait? Peanut yeah, peanut butter. Okay. peanut butter and it's on a uh, like a can that you put on a wire so the can gotcha. turns free. So then they eat it all over the bucket, right? Well, they try to eat. They they go out on that wire and they get on the peanut butter and it immediately flips. So then they drown? Spins, yes. <laughs> and I've heard also if you have a camp or something, if you put antifreeze at the bottom of the bucket, it doesn't yeah, stick. So it doesn't freeze. The and it'll also like whatever with the mice so that they won't decompose and then your whole camp smells like a dead mouse and spring. Many times the they just dry up. Yeah. What's in the trap on the right? What's in the <laughs> <laughs> Somebody put a post it on it so you wouldn't see the name Victor. <laughs> the name on the trap. We're not supposed to. Um, but you notice right it. next to it. Yeah, <laughs> it's one without the. <laughs> the person that wasn't quite as diligent. <laughs> oh, and Fuzz by Mary Roach, which we have here, is a good book for talking about living with animals and problem animals. It doesn't really provide answers, but it is an interesting discussion of those kind of things. So. I'm checking that book out. Okay. Now. Well, right. Mice and rats can cause significant damage inside the house. Mm -hmm. so What's your recommendation on mold? Uh, mold, mold. Moles? Moles? No, no. They had it up there. Chipmunks? Ground dogs. What's your recommendation on ground dogs? How do you get rid of them? <laughs> there are all sorts of things. What did we talk about here? And it gets down to it might be trapping. It's going to be your I've heard for if you're trying to live trap them, I've heard that people have had some success with fruit like melons or apples, apples, things like that. I've never had any luck live trapping them really. I have. I've tried it two different times and I caught skunks both times. Yeah. <laughs> skunks are easier to, to catch. Away the trap. <laughs> you can you the thing is once they found your garden, then it's harder to keep them out. You can there are fences. If you're doing a fence for a groundhog, you have to put it uh, down and then bury the edge of it. Otherwise they'll just go. We got a, a garage, a car garage. It's got dirt floor and we're tunneled under it. Ah, yeah, so you're there. All to come out and look at me. <laughs> so I don't. You get a, a muskrat trap and put it in the hole. Because those ones, when they dig into it, it clamps around them. 
But you have to be careful with your cats. You yeah, that's true. Oh, no, no cats. Well, your neighbors. Yeah, your neighbors might have cats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. They, they do have traps that are like that, but they will catch all the neighborhood cats and everything like that too. Yeah, they, the cats don't keep the traps. But if it's under your garage, sometimes if you can tell uh, when they leave, then uh, try to seal off that section. And it's like you could use rebar, drop the rebar in the ground, uh, you know, anything to make it smaller so they can't get in. Uh, but they want to, you want to get them out of there sooner than later because they're going to be. I guess it, I, I have kind of a similar question, so like with groundhogs, but also I have rat or not rats, but mice that are coming into my camp all the time. Um, I can't. St I can catch the mice, and I can get rid of the groundhogs, but they just get replaced by yeah. a new one. Is there is there anything that actually deters? You said about squirrels and like hot pepper, but is there anything that actually deters mice? Well, well, the it's like the they have to taste it. Yeah. And they just won't eat that. Yeah. So to have them not come in, you mm -hmm. know, when you've got cover and you've got food and you've got water for them, you're the the yeah. the building is the attraction. Mm -hmm. It's like just sealing the building to make sure there's no entrance areas, and you know how small mice are. Yeah, well, they can fit through any any hole basically. Yeah. And I, I will mention if you see where the groundhog is and you know what's you know that that's their their home or whatever, and then you're interested in trying a, a lethal control, they don't recommend the little fire bombs, they used to have smoke bombs. <laughs> because they're well, yeah. fire danger. Yeah. But if you get dry ice, oh. dry ice is carbon dioxide. You poke it in the hole and seal it, and try to seal the other entrances. Uh, it's emitting carbon dioxide. I, uh, my wife's yes. uncle used to, use, used to use a propane cannon. So they have a thing that you, it's like a hose with a little thing oh. you put down in the groundhog hole, and you let the propane out, because the propane is denser than the air, mm -hmm. and then it has an igniter on the end of it that <laughs> blows the hole. Because that, those are pretty effective on, that was, that was on a farm. Yeah. And those are pretty effective on farms because it collapses the entire tunnel system. But there. it's away from the building. Yeah, you don't want to do I it in <laughs> town or... What's that movie with um, the guy who has the war with the ground? Oh, Caddyshack? Caddyshack. Yeah. yeah, this afternoon we'll be showing Caddyshack. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't mention anything about rabbits. I rabbits? had no problem. The only rabbits I had were my house pet rabbits. I've never seen a rabbit in my life. Well, there are hairs in the air. We don't have rabbits up here. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And if, if you want to, uh, if you have an email, we can give you the list of those resources. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.